Let me give it just one more minute. Seventeen fifty per year. It's sent via the postal mail, and you get it in the mail every month. Not an email, postal mail. It's issued every month. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the back, please take your seats. You'll have time to buy merchandise later. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Nebraska Bigfoot Meet. This is the third annual edition. Uh, they asked me to be the MC, and I'm also a speaker. Uh, just as a footnote, uh, back when they had the Sasquatch Symposium in Harrison Hot Springs and in British Columbia back in the mid-90s, I was also the uh, MC for those events as well. So many years later, and I'm doing it again because they asked. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm a union licensed electrician, and I've been doing that since 1985. Believe it or not, I'm 55 years old now. Uh, I got interested in the Bigfoot topic at about age 10 by the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek. And it just kind of sucked me in. And after the internet was kind of developed a little bit more, I found out there was quite a few people that got sucked in by that very movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek. So what else can I tell you about myself? I'm an avid track and field fan. I've been to eight summer Olympic games. In Rio, in Brazil, I was there watching all the track and field. In 2020 in Tokyo, I plan on being there too. Back in my younger day, I used to be an avid runner. Not anymore. Uh, what else? Let's see. Uh, what else? I have the world's largest physical files on Bigfoot. And let me explain a little bit about that. It all got started by a gentleman by the name of George Frederick Haas, who, who with a partner founded the Bay Area Group. And back then there was no internet, there was physical files. And then as he got older, he eventually passed on. And one of his colleagues took possession of all of his files. And his name was Warren Thompson. And Warren Thompson was a colleague of mine. And Warren and George both lived in the Bay Area. And so Warren eventually passed on in 2012. It, it's funny because uh, what is the, because I'm forgetting, because I've never had it, but it seems like I ha have it right now. When you start to lose your memory, what is the? Alzheimer's. He died of Alzheimer's. And uh, so, uh, one day at my house, I got a phone call from his sister, and he says, well, my brother has Alzheimer, and it doesn't look like he's going to live too long, and that uh, he wants to give you all the files, because there's really nothing else to do with it. I have a four-bedroom home, two-story, and three of the bedrooms have all the physical files. So, and this goes back, way back, some of the stuff that has never seen light on the, in on the internet. It's just physical information. I also have in my possession, mostly by me, but partly by them, uh, George and Warren Thompson, the largest personal library on Bigfoot that is, a lot of these volumes have been autographed by people who are no longer with us, such as John Green, such as the late uh, Dr. Bernard Hogelman's and uh, so you can't get these autographs. And some really rare editions, like uh, Betty Allen's uh, Bigfoot book that was one of the earliest ones published. So back in the Sasquatch Symposium days, uh, I used to do at the podium trivia. And so I'm going to start one trivia question. And it's going to be worth $20. I've got it right here in my pocket. So we're giving it out. And the winner is going to be the first person who gets their hand up that I see that has the correct answer. And of course, my talk is on the PG film, short for Patterson Gimlin. So the first hand up, it, it's anyone. 
Can you hear me back there? You, you haven't, I haven't asked the question yet. So, with regard to the Patterson-Gimlin film, they had three horses at the time in question. Name them, firsthand. First hand. Okay. This, we're obviously not talking to an advanced group. I will give you the answer, but that doesn't mean you get the $20. They had Chico, they had HO, and they had Peanuts. Those were the names of the horses. This is obscure, but who knows, maybe in the future it might be of importance. So we'll move on to the next trivia question. What was the name of the newspaper that first had the printed publicity of the event. I see a hand back there, uh, and it just happens to be Bobo uh, from Finding Bigfoot. And the name of the newspaper... That is incorrect. Sir? Incorrect. Newspaper, not magazine. I'm still waiting for hands. What was the name of the newspaper that first printed the first publicity about the Patterson-Gimlin film that was the very next day. Right there, sir. Incorrect. Well, I, I still have my $20. That wasn't a tough question. It was the Eureka Times Standard, October 21st, 1967. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Uh, someone might know it. Uh, what was the name of the reporter who spoke with Roger Patterson that night, October 20th? First hand up. Dr. Jeff Meldrum. That is incorrect. Uh, the name of the reporter, which was in the newsletter, the Bigfoot Times, which I found out because nobody knew for the longest time, was the late Al Tostado. He was the guy who spoke with Roger Patterson by phone that evening. So, uh, let's go to our next question. Uh, where was Roger Patterson born? $20. First hand up. Yes. That is correct. That's real money, too. <laughs> I thought this crowd would be uh, the advanced version for the Patterson-Gimlin film, but I see the, the, everyone here is beginners, but that's okay. We have one more. I guess I should make this an easy question. Uh, generally speaking, and this is, let's just go old information. How many frames are in the Patterson-Gimlin film based on old information? First hand up. It's worth a shirt. Yes, sir. That's incorrect. I'll let, gentlemen, the young man right there. No. Yes, sir. No. The old information was 952 frames. The new information based on Bill Munz's verified film count of the film is 954. So, uh, are we good? There we go. One more question. Uh, in the late 1990s, there was a gentleman that claimed that he was the man in the Patterson-Gimlin, and what is his name? First hand up. Bob Heron Heronimus. That's correct. And I caught him at the corner of my eye. And you get a shirt. So, a little bit about more insights on the PG film. If you were here last time, it's going to be largely what I spoke about last year, but a little bit more. 
And so I am Daniel Perez, the editor and publisher of the newsletter. It's been going on as a physical newsletter sent in the postal mail since January 1998. Comes out every month. We cover everything. So the publication is now 21 years old. So no one else can say that. There is no other physical newsletter being published on the subject. And let's see. And there is the website, uh, BigfootTimes.net. Uh, this is the October 2017 edition of the newsletter. Uh, our headline, the whole issue was devoted to the PG film on the 50th anniversary. One minute of film, 50 years of questions, iconic PG film survives many assaults over five decades. If you look right here, see if I could get the pointer, what am I doing wrong? There we go. This is Bob Gimlin's truck. This was the truck that three horses and Bob and Roger took down there. But according to Bob Gimlin, this bed right here, this was different. It was a different, uh, a different back. But this is the truck. And I believe this is Roger Patterson right here, the person who got the footage. So I'm going to jump around a little bit because we discussed this last year. Some of the best portion of the film was shot at roughly 100 feet. This was based on investigators John Green and Renee DeHinden being there and pulling measurements shortly after the film was shot. So if you look at that exit sign right there where the door is open, you see that exit sign? We measured last year, so there's no need to measure this year. To where I'm standing here, that's roughly 100 feet. So the best portion of the film was shot at roughly this distance. So the subject is always walking away. It doesn't bolt away. And so if you look at that distance in terms of animals for people who hunt or people who watch wildlife, that, there's, a, there's a buffer comfort zone that doesn't mean that you have to hightail it out. I'm assuming, I don't know, because most of the things about Bigfoot we don't know. If I were this close to the front row in the audience and I was the Bigfoot, I would be running away very quickly. But at a hundred feet distance, where the best portion of the film was shot, there's a comfort zone there. And so, this is the Bigfoot Ladies movie camera. This is a Kodak camera similar to the model that Roger Patterson used. It was a Kodak K100 camera with a fixed lens similar to this one. According to the police report, and why do I say police report? Roger Patterson rented the camera in Yakima and failed to pay the rental bill. So he was arrested and released and so there was documentation about the camera. And in the late... Hello? In the late 1990s, uh, Peter Byrne, a uh, Bigfoot, Bigfooter, uh, was able to get a hold of the police report, and it stated in that report that it had a pistol grip. So that means it had something like this on the bottom of the camera to hold the camera. And so why do I say that? Then it gives the operator of the camera, who would normally probably have two hands on it, one hand operation of the camera, which probably made all the difference in the world in terms of getting good quality footage. And I want to mention too, uh, the reason why we continue to talk about the PG film in October of this year will be 52 years. October 20th of 2017 was 50 years. There has never been a film or a video that has come anywhere near the quality of the PG film that we have. So what Roger Patterson contributed to the field was just beyond belief. And I said it last year and I will say it again, 
in all of Bigfooting, this is the single biggest accomplishment ever. It is the crown jewel. And so some of us investigators continue to keep trying and trying to figure out this and that about the film. Uh, one thing that I was determined to find out is who wrote the first article because on the first newspaper article there was never a byline. And so I went to the Eureka Library and started digging into microfilms and then I found a subsequent article uh, November 5th, I believe, of 67, which was a follow-up article. And the author put his name there and he had used some of the same verbiage from his first piece in the second piece. So it was a process of deduction that I said, here was the guy that wrote the article. At the time in question in 1967, a fellow by the name of Andrew Genzoili was also working for the newspaper and he was their Bigfoot guy. And a lot of the people in the Bigfoot community assumed that he was the guy that wrote the article. Not so. So it's important to continue to dig and to find out the real information. And with that, I wanted to say, since I have the camera in my hand, the one final point is that uh, when Bill Munns did his study of the film, I believe he got a copy of the film from Peter Byrne, who had a copy. And it was then he discovered that Peter Byrne's copy of the film possessed 954 frames. Prior to that, when Rene de Hinden was one of the chief investigators of the film, it was assumed that it was 952. So somehow there's two extra frames that Peter Byrne has in his copy, and to date that is the standard as to how many frames that movie film has. 16 millimeter color film. Now if I could find my pointer stick. Right here. So there's the 50th anniversary edition of the PG film and the newsletter. Uh, this was to the left is the latest edition of the newsletter. In 1958, there was a story that was released by the United Press International about a guy who saw something in Riverside, California, Southern California, far away from the Bigfoot activity that was happening in Northern California. Uh, no one could ever put a face to the story. And so this is the first time his image has ever been published right there. That is Charlie Wetzel, if you know the Charlie Wetzel story. You could probably Google it, Charlie Wetzel Bigfoot, and find out. By the time we got to him, he had passed away. We were able, only able to talk to his son. And his son said, my dad did not tell me about this story until I was an adult. And he says, we went back to the site, and I think his father told his son, now grown, he says he wasn't really too game on it. He said he wanted to show him where it happened, but he wasn't really too excited about going back. So the image on the right was the Sasquatch Summit in honor of John Green when he was living uh, for all the work he did. And this was the special coverage on that, and that was in April of 2011. This is the Bigfoot Times special edition. It's called Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. And if you look at Jeff Meldrum's, Dr. Jeff Meldrum's book, it's in the bibliography, and it's also in the bibliography of some of the more scholarly books. When this was published on the 25th anniversary of the film, uh, the late Rene de Hinden said, the best damn thing ever published on the film. Coming from him, I took it as a, a tremendous compliment. I, there's, I think I printed 4,000 copies. <clears throat> Excuse me. The artist who did this work, the cover of my children's books, uh, you could find on Amazon, the Kindle edition, it's $2.99. Stephen DeMarco did this cover illustration and all the illustrations here. He's sitting right here in the yellow shirt. And uh, this image right here is the depiction of the famous Jacko story, 1884 from Yale, British Columbia. So we thought it would be a nice cover illustration, and there it is. The physical copies of the book are sold out. There was a small print run, and so now it's only available on Amazon Kindle. This was published by me, 
danny dan daniel i prefer daniel in one nine hundred eighty eight these are super rare now so i'm assuming you could find one on e bay i don't know but this is strictly bibliographical information on the subject up through nineteen eighty eight notice the play on words big foot notes ok this is the famous movie frame showing the sprockets on the right hand so you get this is what you call a full frame let's see right here is what they call the big tree there of course is the subject right here is a stump they this stump has been named smiley stump if you look very closely it looks like it's got a smiling face on it there is another stump right here that has has been cut the front part of it the front part of it seems like it's cut this way like this this piece of wood according to Rene de Hinden was retrieved either in 1971 or 1972 by the late Rene de Hinden the Canadian investigator he took it home as a souvenir maybe knowing but maybe not knowing that this would prove crucial in determining the size of the subject in the movie film I want you to take notice of this piece of uh, this dead tree here which is just basically looks like a, a cue stick on a pool table and so we'll see this later this is the big log seen prominently right in the floor footage. This is no longer on the film site. Last October, I was there. A gentleman was there, I think his name was Mike Moraz, and he said he made, met Rene de Hinden at Laos Camp many years ago, which is close to the film site, and they went to see the film site, and by then, I want to say this was probably early 80s, that notice, noticeable fallen tree was gone. And I think Rene had mentioned that it just kind of disintegrated into the, into the ground. And we looked for it last October, uh, trying to find evidence of that tree. And I'm thinking now that maybe they just cut it out. Maybe people that were camping in the area, unbeknownst, not even knowing this was the film site, just, hey, this would make good firewood. And it eventually got just chopped up because there's really no evidence of it there anymore. But what I'd like you to take notice of, look at the shad, oops, let's go back. Let's do it one more time. The shadow is right underneath the tree, which might suggest to anyone with some common sense that the sun was high in the sky. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And I put quotations around 352 because this is the frame that's most often released to the public. They call this frame 352 and a lot of people think there's 352 frames in the film. This is only part way into the film. I put quotations because in reality, it's probably th frame 354 or 355. But it's been dubbed frame 352, and that's good enough for our discussion purposes. This was shot by an Arizona man. That is the stump. This is about 1977. There is the cue ball stick tree. Go back. There's that stump. And there's that tree. So that's 10 years of the film site. Right there. And this is a close-up shot. And the investigator who did this, it just comes to mind, his name is Walt Leeds and he's still living. He was a colleague of Rene de Hinden. Uh, right here we see a very famous investigator. This is the late Rene de Hinden. This is about summer, August of 1977. Uh, next to him is the late Barbara Wasson. 
and she authored a book in 1979, which is super rare now, hard to get a hold of, called Sasquatch Apparitions. And this, he was doing his film site work here, and you could see what the film site looked like at this time. Right there is that branch again. And so when I discussed earlier in my presentation about the fold-out postcard with the frames, pictures of the film site from 68 to 2012, this shows up. So that's a giveaway that you're at the right spot. There's only one Patterson-Gimlin film site. There's, over the years, after when the film site was quote unquote lost, there was numerous investigators and researchers that said, no, here it is, and another guy would say, no, here it is, but this was all wrong. It was just people that weren't, didn't invest enough time in research to find out the proper answer. Uh, there's a tripod there and they have a camera, so I'm assuming that maybe they made some additional footage of the film site at that time. Uh, Rene Hinden is gone. He has two grown children, Eric and Martin to Hinden, so I'm sure all of that is in their possession. Probably Eric to Hinden, his oldest boy. This was interesting. As I told you earlier, I follow the Olympic Games track and field in particular. So as I was thumbing through uh, Runner's World from June of 2008, it mentioned that this guy here in Africa on the left-hand side, uh, he's jogging. On the right-hand side is Patty, which is the subject's name, flipped around, so instead of going from left to right, she's going from right to left. But Patty is walking. And by definition, walking is when you have one foot on the ground at all times. So she does that. The man on the right is jogging, but you notice how the angle on their knee is very similar. But the guy on the left is jogging, Patty is walking. But, and so the point of this is that her walk is very unique. And for those people who insist or think that it's just a guy running around in a costume, I would reevaluate, recheck that idea. And then the idea of this being an individual in a costume, if you look at the broad history of science, science, when there's a scientific claim, like many years ago there was this thing called cold fusion, Fleischmann and Pons. And they said, this is the new way of making energy. And they debunked that because nobody could duplicate it. So here's the proof in the pudding with the PG film, the Patterson-Gimlin film. If what is behind me is a man in a costume, why can't anybody duplicate it? Nobody has been able to duplicate that film. And Dr. Jeff Meldrum in his various studies has pointed out the ultra-fine subtleties in the film where you could see the, the digits moving and from the tracks, the mid torsal break. There's just a ton of detail in the film, in the subject in the film, that it's just like, if this is a costume that Roger Patterson made, he fooled the world. So what was he doing fooling around with this when he should have been in Hollywood making movie films and been, been probably bigger than Steven Spielberg? It doesn't make sense. And by the way, this location is not easy to access. This is really in the back country where this film was shot. The reason why Roger and Bob went in there in Labor Day, so this the film was shot October 20th, in August, end of August, beginning of September of 67, there were tracks reported, Bigfoot tracks reported, about six miles on the same ridge that the PG film site is on, uh, on an area called Blue Creek Mountain. So Rene DeHinden and John Green and another fellow by the name of Don Abbott decided to go down to check things out. They were able to find the tracks and make some casts. 
And so this area behind me, the Bluff Creek area, even prior to the, when this film was shot, had tremendous activity, Bigfoot-wise. And Renee and John were there early on, and by the time they got home, they found out, well, not by the time they got home, but later in October, when Roger and Bob went in there, Roger went in there because he was making a documentary film. And he, went, he, wanted, he had hoped to get documentary footage of the footprints in the, in the area. So he not only got lucky from get, uh, seeing footprints, he also saw and filmed the subject. You see these rocks? Does anyone know anything about them? June 23rd of 1968, John Green goes back to the film site with about a dozen people. One of those persons was the late George Haas, who is connected to Warren Thompson, who is connected to me. What he did, believe it or not, the, the remains of the foot tracks in the sandbar were still there. George picked up these three rocks as a souvenir that were on the bottom of an impression, a trap. Those are them. They're in a safety deposit box, uh, and I have them now. This gives you a, this I believe was done by Chris Murphy. It gives you a different perspective of where things are. Uh, the big tree, and you can follow the yellow big tree is here in frame 352. You follow it out, and the tree is right there. And let me tell you, that is a big Douglas fir tree. And so as a note, when we were there in July of 2012, about a dozen of us, we went there to survey the site, to uh, absolutely recognize the site as the site to make sure the logs and the stumps in the ground and everything was consistent with what was found earlier to double check. And so we pulled the measurement. I don't think anyone had did this but done this before. We pulled the measurement from the big tree all the way to the creek. 272 feet. So there's a lot of real estate on this film site. And this this picture here by the way was shot by Rene de Hinden. And at the time, you could see how open the film site was. There is the log in the foreground right there. Right there, and you can see it right here. And so the subject, this is Rene de Hinden's kid right there, and this is the path of the subject, or at least what we think the path was. There is the big tree. This is October 20th. 2017, that is me, all five foot seven of me, standing in front of the big tree, so you could really see how big that tree is. It is massive. And it's the biggest tree on that film site. So this was taken on the 50th anniversary of the film site. And so we had uh, a forest ranger there, or he might be retired now, by the name of Robert Leiterman, and he told us, you're allowed in a national forest, maybe someone could correct me if I'm wrong, you're allowed in a national forest to trim trees but not to cut them down. So I said, let's do it. So we went in there with pruning shears, Bobo was with us as well, and we chopped a lot away, all the debris, all the overgrowth, so you could see. So even this image is cleaned up too, we cleaned up a lot of brush, and we continue to do so every time we're there. Right around the late 1970s, does anyone know who Eric Bechord was, the late Eric Bechord? Also, uh, his initials were E.B., uh, but he was an interesting personality in Bigfooting. He had all sorts of ideas about what they're all about, and he would call people late at night, including Dr. Jeff Malgram, you know, probably at 3 o'clock in the morning. Only once, but yeah, so... In, 
not only did he call him, but he called various investigators. So he would call at these odd hours. So he took a Kodak K100 camera and made this recreation film, and I think that's him in a gorilla costume right there. This was actually made at the PG film site. And as you, I mean, you tell me, does that look like a Bigfoot or a man in a suit? Does that look like the PG film? So in terms of trying to recreate apples to apples, he took the same type of camera, the same type of film, at the location to do this recreation film. This is the frame from it. I wish it were, had more clarity so we could see better. This was shot, the image with the black circle, in October of 2008. They called me up, Kip Morrow and his crew, and they said, do you want to go to the PG film site with us? And I said, well, I'm kind of working. It's really a busy season. I'm a union licensed electrician, a lot of money to be made. And so I said, well, what the heck? I'll take a week off. I'll go with you guys. And so as we were looking around, uh, the business about artifacts that can be seen later after the fact, this is 51 years later. So if, let's go back. If you look here, there is the smiley face stump. There is the subject, Patty. There is a protrusion of a branch from a log. 51 years later, October of 2008, Robert, Robert, testing, Robert Leiderman says, I think this is the same location, and this is, the black circle and the red circle are closer to the creek, so what you're seeing there is uh, the perspective is off. This is much closer to the creek, away from the subject. But there is that same thing. And if you look very carefully, we lined this stump is back here. See that green right there? Believe it or not, that's not a blob squatch. This is a person with a green shirt that we had stand right there because... If I didn't do it, though, Bill, I was just going to say, if I didn't have bad luck, I'd have no luck whatsoever. So anyway, this is the film site, October 2008, and this is one of the artifacts. So I'm sure if we looked even further, we could find even more stuff. So in 2012, I was in London for the Olympic Games in the summer, and then I don't know a whole lot of places where special things are, and they said, well, Stonehenge is in this area, too, and I said, well, let's go see it. So I went to go see it, but when you visit Stonehenge, you can't go touch the rocks or touch the, the, the structure. There's a, there's, you could go walk around it, but you can't go touch it. But according to Paul Vella, the, the late Paul Vella, who was with me at the time, he's from England, he said that when he was a boy, you were able to go up and touch it and stuff. So I suspect one day in the future that once the PG film site becomes more famous and a lot more people want to go see it, that maybe they're going to cordon it off to the point where you could see the playing field but you can't get in it. I don't know. It'll probably be dependent on the government and uh, the Forest Service. Well, now I'm trying to... I'm having a little bit of a sticking issue.
wasn't me. As he's working on a technical issue, which I hope we could get resolved real quick, I'm just curious who in this audience thinks they're the tallest person here? Any people over six feet? It, I'll tell you what, since Bobo is for, has finding Bigfoot fame, we could bring them up here and we will use them as a proof of concept experiment. So we've discussed this frame here, and this is another one just showing Robert Leiterman and the actual picture I took. So when, when this was, when I took this picture, I had to get behind him, sit on the wet moss to get this great shot. Maybe you could sit just in the audience in the front for a little bit. And so the back side of this person not is Robert Leiterman. And so he's, and you could see Patty in the inset there. That's the smiley face. And like I said, between that artifact and the smiley face stump, we had the person stand there with the green uh, thing that you see in the black circle to make sure that we were shooting in line. February of 1968, Ivan Sanderson published this. And to a lot of people who got a hold of this magazine, this made the subject very real to them. And I'm not sure if anyone ha uh, possessed a copy of this magazine, but at the time it was selling for 50 cents, so you could have went and bought it for 50 cents. You'd be lucky to get it for maybe $100 now on eBay, a pristine copy of this magazine. So it was one of the first magazines, if not the first magazine, to publish frames from the movie film. Ivan Sanderson is the late Ivan Sanderson now, but he wrote one of the first books on Bigfoot called Abominable Snow Men in 1961. And I think Dan Nedrillo had mentioned that was one of the first books that he read about the topic. Uh, very famous magazine. Uh, it's now defunct, but Ivan Sanderson wrote this. And then, believe it or not, what most people don't know, trivia, is there was a follow-up magazine article in Argosy many months later, at which time he disclosed there were films, as in plural. There's a film of the subject. After they took that film, there was a second film of the footprint. So he disclosed that, and that was the giveaway that there were two films. A film of the subject. A second reel was put in the camera to take a film of the foot tracks. Uh, the reel of the foot tracks is possibly in the vaults of the BBC. Uh, Roger's widow, Pat Patterson, loaned it to them and apparently never got it back. Loaned the original. And by the way, in terms of the original PG film, uh, when Roger was getting sick and died, he died early, I think at age 37, uh, he lent the film out, the original film out, and it never came back, so people think they know where the original movie is, but nobody really knows, because it's not in the possession of Pat Patterson, Roger's widow. He has a very good copy, but not the original. In one year prior, before the film, Roger wrote this book, a self-published book. And at the time, it was going for $1.95, and I guess if you could think of it as a stock, it would have went up tremendously. A pristine copy of this book might set you back two, three hundred dollars. And it didn't talk about the film because he hasn't shot the film yet. He was obsessed with Bigfoot. And when I spoke with his widow, Pat Patterson, I asked her something to the effect. I said, well, once Roger got the Bigfoot bug, bug uh, tell me about his life, and she said, well, he was always gone. He had three kids and a wife, and he was so into Bigfoot, he was always gone checking out things, and he recruited Bob Gimlin to go on the famous trip to Northern California where they got the most famous piece of footage ever. Lucky for Bob. This is me. July of 2012, James Bobo, uh, Bobo was there with me, and so this, this is, I think, one of the measurements we pulled, and this may have been from the big tree out to the creek, and so you see behind me is the rock and the creek down there. And yes, I do carry a gun when I go out in the woods, because 
Personally, I think you're foolish because a mountain lion or bear is going to move a lot faster than you are. And uh, you want to have some sort of protection. I'm not out there to kill anything, but I'm out there because I know there's wild animals out there. I, all my years in the world, I've never seen a mountain lion, but I have seen mountain lion tracks. So that tells me they're out there. So that's me. And you can see the image is a little bit blurry. But that's exactly what it, you'd expect from big footing, a little bit of blurry in the photo. Now obviously I didn't take that photo. This one's a little sharper. And so this is my trusty dog, Pree. Bogle has a dog, and uh, Cliff Blackman also finding, from Finding Bigfoot has a dog too. And they, those dogs have been down there too. So this dog, Pree, has been down there numerous times. So I have in my right hand a large ruler that we use for, to get some measurements. In my left hand is a real out tape measure that they use in track and field meets that goes up to 100 feet. So we're using that tool in our toolbox to pull measurements, real measurements. My gloves, because when you're back there, there's a lot of stuff when you're going through the brush that you want to Keep your hands clear and free. Okay, the gentleman you see back there is James Bobo Fay. He, in July of 2012, participated in this experiment. See the camera to the right on the tripod? That is the same type of camera that Roger Patterson used, the Kodak K100 camera. And then I'm also shooting with my 35mm uh, which is in my hand, and Bobo, right there, has our pole right there for measurement of him, and the measurement on the ground there, he's exactly 50 feet away from the camera. So when Roger was shooting Patty, it was twice the distance. So you see how big he is in the frame, he's quite a bit smaller, 100 feet away. So the further I go back from you, I'm not thinking, but it looks like I'm smaller to you. So there he is, this is a close-up shot. Uh, as you could probably see, he's lost a lot of weight, but he was part of an experiment in July of 2012. A lot of mosquitoes in the area. This right here, we think, is an area that Patty walked through in the footage. And this area, we didn't have to clear any brush, it was already open. We use this 24-inch piece of 2 by 4 to get a scale. And I want to mention the piece of wood now that René de Hinden retrieved from the film site, a souvenir that would later prove to be crucial in determining the height of the subject. And so you can see the 24 there. That piece of wood is still on the film site, the last we checked. Uh, the people here in the Nebraska meet were kind enough to build me another one. It's just a 2x4 with 24 inches on it. You could measure it. So what we did when I shot this picture, the 24 inches is used the scale to measure Bobo. So here's the key. If the 2x4 is in the same plane with Bobo, that that is absolutely valid as a measuring device to measure him. I believe Bobo is six foot three inches tall. And so I put it out there in my newsletter. I just put the photo, posted the photo, but did not post anything in terms of measurements. I said, this piece of wood is 24 inches long. You tell me how tall Bobo is. And everyone came back that he's about six two, six three. So it is valid to measure the subject on the condition that it is in the same plane. This is the front side of the film track. If you look right there, that is Bluff Creek. But Bluff Creek over the years changes course according to the area. You can see all of this real estate here has toppled away. This is part of the film site here in this area, but mostly going this way. And so it changes according to the storms uh, that are in this area and the washes and the flooding. And so this creek used to be up here. And it, it just 
it's going down and down, and I think now it's at the bedrock here. It's probably as low as it'll ever go because underneath is all rock now instead of soil. Remember I mentioned to you the log and the shadow that was directly underneath? So Rene de Hinden went in there and other people as well, and he said that film was shot based on the shadow underneath the log between 1.30 and 2 o'clock in that time frame right there. And so this image behind me was shot, I think, October 14th of 2014 when I was there by myself and my dog. This is high noon. This is at 1.30. And I'm, I'm standing roughly where Patty would be, uh, looking up and you could see the sun right there high in the sky. And so I always say that if you're trying to make the point, it always helps when you have visual information to press the point home. So Roger and Bob get the famous movie film, October 20th. That evening or the next morning, it starts to rain. And so they made Bob Dinman, who was the owner of the truck that went in there, made a decision to clear out because they were on the opposite side of the creek. The creek started rising and they said, we need to get out of here, otherwise we're going to be stuck. So they cleared out. So a United States Forest Service timber management individual by the name of Lyle Laverty, who was working in the area for up to six months with a timber logging crew, uh, was in this area, maybe about three miles away, when this film was shot. And so over the weekend, they went out of the area to get supplies. And on Monday, October 23rd, uh, they came back and they knew about the film. And they were driving the roads and they said, they were just kind of like, well, maybe we could find it. If we could find it, we could take a few minutes and take a look. And so Lyle Laverty got these photos here. And I will show you. And I hope you buy copies of this track here. And there's one left, so hopefully one of you will be lucky. According to Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who also spoke with Lyle Laverty and myself on multiple occasions, twice, this was shot Monday, October 23rd. Uh, in, even if it, it rained very hard, but that track is still visible. You have to, that soil there holds tracks very well. And so this is after a rain and you could see the track. So, October 23rd comes and goes. Towards the tail end of October, the Canadian Bigfoot investigator Bob Pitness comes in. And he wanted to know, he wanted to see if he could find the film site. And with his brilliant uh, I mean, an idea that, you know, he just didn't look at them, he documented them. He made plaster of Paris castings. So this duplicate plaster of Paris casting, and there's one left here that Jeff Nelson has, and if you want to buy it, it's at his table. But this casting belongs to that photo right there. And so before Jeff Nelson came along, there was this idea with some of the early Bigfooters uh, John Green was a newspaper guy. Rene DeHinden salvaged a lead at, a Vancouver, at the Vancouver Gun Club. I was an electrician. What did we know about anatomy or any of the biological subtleties that you're supposed to, or you could see in a footprint if you really look? So Dr. Meldrum was the first person to come along at the stand to notice this feature right here a mid torsal break, and he discusses this in, a, in his book. It's not an arch. It's a, he could explain more in his books, but this is a feature that's part of the foot that's causing us to do this. This is a mid torsal break, and so we've seen this now in various tracks. And up to that time, it was our impression, some of the early investigators, based on this piece of branch, that maybe there was some another branch underneath that it stepped on. Not so. It, it just kind of 
You just get the impression, well, maybe it's stuck on a branch or something. That is not the case. So I'll return this. This is the original casting, and you could see it in Willow Creek at the Willow Creek Bigfoot Museum. This is the actual casting that Bob Kipnis made. There's another image of it uh, face on. And you can see that it broke and they glued it back together. But there is the mid coastal break. And so when Bob Pitness went in there, uh, he took some plaster with him, but he didn't know how many castings he would make. And he ended up making, I think, about 10 of them, maybe 11, because according to John Green in an offhand statement, he just kind of said it, and I said, I never heard that before. He said that Bob Gimlin gave one, there was, I think, 10 castings made, and maybe 11, and he said, well, Bob Gimlin gave one of the original castings to his then-girlfriend. Never figured out who she is, but there was someone out there that has an original casting from the Patterson Gimlin film site, who was associated with Bob Pitman. So there is an original right there that can be seen in the old crate, and you can see the dynamic features of that, where the heel is, and the torso break, and the tongues. And so you look very closely, and this has, looks very much similar to a modern man, but different. This track is about 14 and a half inches long. This is June of 68. The late George Haas took all these photos. And they're in my possession now, because it went from George to Warren Thompson to me. None of these photos have ever been published, released on television or in books or in magazines. This is a highly cropped version because I don't want people stealing my property. Uh, there's John Green to the left, and there is his son. That is the film site right there. That's the camera he took to make his recreation film uh, with uh, Jim McLaren, who in boots was six foot five inches tall, which made a good recreation subject for the film with Patty. There is Jim McLaren to the right and John Green to the left. They are looking down at the remains of the tracks. This is June of 68. Believe it or not, the remains of the tracks were still there. So when they made the recreation footage, they were able to go right next to the existing trackway. Uh, Jim McLaren no longer lives in the United States, but is still living. And I asked him, how close did you walk to the trackway, the original trackway? He said, I, I walked right next to it as close as you can get. So his film, the film of Jim McLaren, is essentially the same path that Patty walked in October of 67. And so there they are, looking at the film site. And you might look at this, some of you more seasoned they put in, and I've never seen this image before, but there it is. If you look closely, there is that log with the cut mark in the front, still there. On a website called the Bigfoot Forums, a lot of people discuss this information, and they asked me, they said, how could that log, how, how could that stump still be there? And I told them, I don't know, but it's there. Here is the picture. And that was in October of 2018. It's still there. I think this is a video. Let me see. This was shot, this is the film site, this was shot October 14th of 2014. My trusty dog was with me, you'll see him a little bit. There is the film site, how it looked in 2014. You can see all the trees that have grown up. You can see some of the stumps that are still there. Right there, and I think that smiley face right back there. The big tree is way back there. There's my tripod, my gloves, my dog scoping over the area. So I would tell you if you have anything that you want to put on your bucket list, 
go through the PG film site before you could no longer see it or before it burned down because California's had all these tremendous wildfires. Ah, there was always a question as to what lens was used to make the famous footage. So I went back there, this is my experimentation. So Bill Munch did a lot of work in this regard, trying to figure out the, the lens that was used to try to get an accurate determination using a photographic formula to determine the size of the subject. So there was a candidate for 15 millimeters, 17, 20, and 25. To my memory, Rene de Hinden, the late Rene de Hinden told me that it was shot with a 25 millimeter lens. But that might not be so. So if you look to the left, there is the 15 millimeter lens. And there is the 25 millimeter lens. The circle right here is what you'll see when you put your eye to the back of the camera to see. This is what you see. When it starts to film, you see this oval? This is what the camera picks up and records right here. You see this tree right here? There's the 25 millimeter lens. There's the 15 millimeter lens. So the field of view on the 15 millimeter lens picks up a lot more real estate. And when you look at the film, you realize that you, you are picking up a lot of the real estate. The, in the lens, the field of view is very wide because you can see a lot to your left and a lot to your right. This is the type of film that was used, Kodachrome, Kodachrome film. And you look at the top here, the film price does not include processing. But at the time, for some of you old timers, there were films that once you took the film, 16 or 8 millimeters, you dropped it in an envelope and it was already paid for it, and they sent it back to you. Uh, some of you might remember that. That's how it was done. But on this case here, you had to send it in and pay for it. That's the type of film that was used to get secure this famous movie. Possibly one of the most famous wildlife movies ever shot. This was an experiment we did in October of 2018. The test subject this time is Kit Morrow. So it seemed that my first experimentation with Bobo was a little bit challenged. They said, that really doesn't work. And these were people just talking, but it does work. It does work. So I did the experiment again with Kit Morrow, and this is an area near Bluff Creek. The film site is if you were to go down where those trees are and go down, you'd be at the film site. This time, I took a 24-inch uh, piece of wood uh, from the, one of the trees and cut it off, and we used this as a test to measure him and I'm exactly 50 feet away. This time what I did is I shot with my Nikon D750. I shot really low, and I shot at eye level. Roger Patterson was 5 feet 3 inches tall. I'm 5 7. So if I had the camera roughly here, then I would be light for light. But then I said, well, let's do one, shoot very low, shoot at eye level, and then he had a truck. So I got up on his truck, and I shot at this distance too, shooting down, to see if that would affect the outcome, the result. Does not. There is another view of him sideways, and there is the piece of wood 24 inches uh, in the same plane as he is. This was put together by Chris Murphy, Again, we see the piece of wood. The big tree is back here. Rene de Hinden collected this. It would later be used as one way of trying to determine the height of the subject. And you see right here, 87.5 inches. And you can see plainly that that piece of wood is on the forest floor right there. And I want to just take a moment to show you roughly how on 5.7. Can someone hold my microphone?
when my son is the seven feet, what they think the subject was was seven foot three inches tall. So if I stand at this second rung on this uh, stairwell, I'm close to how tall the subject would be right there. That's seven foot three inches tall, 87 and a half inches or 87 inches. So you can get a feel for how big the subject was, or at least what they think it was. This is, this is the piece of wood. This is now in the possession of Rene de Hinden's oldest boy, Eric de Hinden. This was featured in Chris Murphy's book, uh, Mary the Sasquatch, which is an excellent book. And so it's almost, it's 26 point two five, twenty six and a quarter inches. But for our experimental purposes, we chopped it down to an even two feet. And so there it is. That is the late Warren Thompson. This was shot probably 1980 or so. The gun you see in his hand was the gun that Bob Gilman used to own. He sold it to an individual by the name of Bruce Barney, but this is the photo of the gun that he had. It was a I think a 30 odd six. So Bob told me in an interview that he said uh, Roger and Bob made a pact that they wouldn't shoot that they felt it was too human or whatever, or just went through the big foot in general. But Bob told me, he said, well, if that thing would have caused me, I would have broken fire. That's the end of the discussion. But it just kept walking away. It never posed a threat. But that was the gun that was on the same side that Bob didn't even have with him. This is all the acting. This is probably a current photo. Dave Murphy sent it along to me. He is Roger Patterson's brother-in-law. Roger Patterson's sister, Ida, is still married to him. He's a multi-millionaire who made his money in the pagan business. But he plays a crucial role in the patterson Dinwin film because that film was sent to him by Roger Patterson somewhere, somewhere from the Eureka, California area, which is for all practical purposes, close to the same site. And I'm ready that he took the seat the next day, October 21st. By October 22nd, they were viewing that film at Ivy Atlee's home uh, in Yakima. And so what I did see, when I said in my presentation new insights about the film, is that according to Don Rabbit, he had a telephone conversation with Aldi Atley, and this is me, is that that movie footage was processed by an acquaintance. And that's the key word, is that between Roger and Aldi Atley, they knew who they were going to take that film to to process it. And then the only other bit of information, because no one has ever figured out who processed the film, they, it, it, the only thing we know now is Based on Al Diakli's testimony, is that it was an acquaintance. So it was somebody that they knew. But Roger Patterson, shortly after the film was shot, spoke with the newspaper reporter. The reporter asked him, where was the film shot? And Roger responded with words to this effect. He said it would jeopardize the man's job if it were known. That's almost an exact quote. So that would tell me, as a research and investigator, that that person worked for a photo processing firm. He wasn't a one-man shop. So if you, you don't fire yourself if you're a one-man shop. If you're working for someone doing it after I am, or not on company time, but on company money, that his name was kept a secret. To this day, nobody knows who processed that film. Only that it was processed, because the film was first shown October 22nd, uh, 1967, two days after the film was shot, at Ivy Atlee's house. And he's still living, but not talking.